there, my name is Megan and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a spoiler free review for Ship of Magic by Robin Hobb. But before we go ahead and get on into the review, if you are not already subscribed to my channel, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well as the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I post new bookish content. I post new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and sometimes other days throughout the week. Also, don't forget to check down in the description box for links to my social media, my Buddy Read Discord, and my Patreon, where you can be entered into winning quarterly book giveaways. The way that I structure my reviews is I talk about the world, plot, characters, things that I liked and the things that I didn't like, and then I give the book an overall rating. If you're interested in just skipping to one of those particular topics, then I'll go ahead and put timestamps down below. Ship of Magic is the first book in Robin Hobb's Live Ship Traders trilogy. This is a trilogy that takes place in the same world as the Farseer trilogy, but it takes place in a different part of the world, and it also follows completely different characters. The setting of the story takes place in a port city called Bingtown, and Bingtown was founded by these trader families. And at the founding of this town, they made a covenant with these magical people that live up the Rain Wild River. And the Rain Wild people allow the traders of Bingtown to trade in magical artifacts, as well as along different port cities throughout this land. But the Rain Wild people also made an agreement with these, these traders that they would build live ships for them and live ships are built out of something called wizard wood. The interesting thing about these live ships is that they are called live ships because they can actually gain awareness and sentience after so many years and it's interesting how it happens because as the kind of head of each trader family dies they take their body to the live ship and their consciousness or their memories their legacy their presence kind of is consumed by the ship and the ship takes on all of the memories and awareness of the ancestors of each live ship family. Live ships are extremely expensive. It's very hard for people to get them and they are coveted by people who are not of the trader family legacy. Each ship has a figurehead and a figurehead is the one that can talk and interact with people and that's where we see the most human characteristics of the live ships. Ship of Magic focuses on one specific trader family called the Vestrits, and the patriarch of this family at the beginning of the book passes away. So they take him to their live ship, Vivacia, and he dies on Vivacia's deck, and because of that, she is able to quicken and she awakens. We also follow the daughter of this family named Althea, who, because of the deaths of her brothers years ago when they were little, has kind of taken up the mantle of a son, and she thought that she was going to take over captainship of the Vivacia once her father died. And then we follow out the sister Kefria, who is older than her, and her husband Kyle. And Kyle has been employed to Captain Vivacia until Althea becomes ready to take over it. Way early on in the story, we see a lot of animosity and hatred between Kyle and Althea. And upon Ephraim, the uh, patriarch of this family, dies, we find out that he left the ship and the captain ship to Kefria and Kyle and completely left Althea out of any type of responsibility, ownership, or anything for the live ship Vivacia. Because she spent so much time on Vivacia sailing around with her father, she has actually developed a deep bond, a deep bond with the ship. So when the ship quickens and gains awareness, it is very upset that Althea is not there. We also learn that the Vestrit family has been having a lot of financial trouble, and we learn that the uh, patriarch Ephraim has refused to train with the Rain Wild people because he finds that dabbling in magic can cause a lot of problems. So we follow the mother of Althea, whose name is Ronica, as she is trying to deal with their financial problems. Kefria and Kyle also have three children, and one of the main point of views we have in the story is Wintro. Wintro is about 13, 14 years old. He is sent off to be a priest earlier on, but because Kyle does not want Althea on Vivacia, he ends up forcing his teenage son to become a sailor and work on Vivacia because Kyle knows that in order for the live ship to function as it should, it needs someone with the Vestrit blood, and his son is half Vestrit. Wintrow 
really, really rebels against this. He doesn't want anything to do with being a sailor. He wants to be a priest. So a lot of the story we follow his dealing with his lot in life, what's happened to him and his struggles as he learns to be a sailor because he's really not particularly athletic or outdoorsy. His dealing with his relationship with his father who is very tyrannical and also developing a bond with Vivesha because he is part of the Vestra family and Vivesha does take a liking to him. This whole time Althea is hellbent on getting Vivesha back. She knows that Kyle is not right to be captain. He is not a Vestra. He doesn't understand the relationships between live ships and their owners and she is going to do anything possible to take Vivesha back from Kyle. And then we follow a pirate named Kenneth. He is kind of like a pirate lord and he is one of the POVs on the of the book and he all he wants is a live ship. He wants to steal a live ship. So he finagles his way into these smaller ports along the coast. He learns a way to kind of trap live ships and that is his goal and we follow him. So as you can probably tell, this plot is fairly detailed, fairly intricate, and each character storyline is interwoven within one another. And then we have the Rain Wilds people who over the years have made these deals with the trader families and we also have some contention going on in this actual satrap. The uh, kind of ruler of this satrap has been basically stealing from the people. He's got a substance abuse problem. He's allowing other um, nations and people from other places to come into his country and get land and resources rather than allowing his people to have it. So a lot of the trader families are very angry with their satrap and it's almost like an uprising or war within the, the satrapy might be on the horizon. So definitely a lot going on in this story. I feel like book one was a huge setup for the rest of the series because the plot, there's just so many different plot lines that need to come together. So a lot of book one was this setup in my opinion. Now I'm going to talk about the characters. There are a lot of characters, so I'm going to try and move quickly. So the first character we have, who I thought was supposed to be the protagonist, and she is, is Althea, and she is Efron and Ronica's daughter, and she has created this bond with Vivesha, and all she wants to do is get Vivesha back. She knows that that is her ship. She is a Vestra through and through, and she will do right by her. And I really didn't have a problem with Althea. I never really connected with her on a super deep level. I understand that her motivations were to do such a thing, and in the story, Story. women you know it's looked down upon them for being sailors so right away she had a lot going against her there were all of these societal expectations that were placed on her that she was trying to rebel against because that's not what she wanted in life and I felt like all of that was fine um, I feel like she was a little bit emotionally disconnected to everybody um, especially Brashen who was a guy that obviously loved her and wanted to help her get through things I just felt like she didn't know how to to either access her emotions or she was repressing her emotions and it was just one of the things that I didn't like about her so much but she's a very like goal-oriented character and if she wants something like she's just tunnel visioned she's not gonna let anything especially a relationships or emotions get in the way of that goal and right now her goal is to get Vivesha back then we have Wintrow. Wintrow is Kyle and Kefria's son or Althea's nephew and I actually grew to like him quite a bit over the story because he's like I said about 13, 14 and he just has a horrible hateful father and he is having to learn to reconcile his two identities. His identity of wanting to be a priest and his identity of being forced to be a sailor which he does grow to I want to say tolerate over time but we definitely see a lot of maturity in him because he understands that you know sometimes you have to make sacrifices and for the greater good you can't just focus on what you want all the time even if you're being wronged a lot of bad stuff happens to Rintro for someone that is be that is so young and I feel like all of that just molded him into being a great character and towards the end of the book we do see him kind of stand up for himself and stand up for what he knows needs to be done and I really appreciated that and we have our side character Brashen and he's kind of like a love interest for Althea and I'm really hoping that he has more of a part in the subsequent books because I have read the synopsis of book two so I know that he's in book two but he is just he just tries to do the right thing. He was a sailor for Efron the Vestrit father and Efron really really liked Brashen. He recognized that he was a good guy and he told Brashen upon his death to watch out for Althea. So I feel like Brashen is just one of those guys that's honorable and is going to try to do what's right. 
Then we have Ronica. This is Althea's mother and I I really don't know what to think about her because at the beginning of the book I thought that she was just horrible and what she did to Althea was just wrong and I feel like any mother would have recognized that. But then as the book progressed, Ronica and her daughter Kefria, Althea's sister, kind of start seeing things the truth about things and recognizing that their decisions earlier on in the book were wrong and were able to admit that they were possibly wrong. So we did see a little bit of growth there. And I tell you what, Ronica is tough. Like she has had to run the household while her husband was out sailing and she has really had to learn how to deal with their financial troubles. She's had to learn how to deal with the Rainwild folks who she owes money to for Vivacia. And there's just a lot going on with those relationships. And she she's just a tough, tough cookie. And then we have Malta, who is Kefria's daughter also, who I didn't think was going to play a big part in this book, but actually does. And she is just young and stupid and makes horrible decisions that really remind me of Kyle's decisions, like she thinks like Kyle. And she's just making these decisions that's going to get her entire family in trouble. And something happened towards the latter half of the book that I'm interested to see how that plays out in book two, because I think it's going to be an important part or Robin Hobb wouldn't have included it. And then finally, we have Kenneth the pirate, and he does have his own point of view. Kenneth's not especially likable. The way that he treats people, the way that he treats, you know, his shipmate, his first mate, his men, the way that he treats women is just absolutely horrible. So he's just a pirate through and through. He's only thinking about himself and what he wants and material possessions. So I, once again, think that Kenneth will have some sort of change for good or bad as the story progresses. I really don't know where to put him with regards to all of these characters yet so yeah he's one I'm going to keep my eye on. So now I'm going to talk about the things that I liked. So first off would be just the general setting. If you know anything about me or my channel you know that I really like books that take place on ships in the ocean with pirates and this is definitely that through and through. I just love the setting, the port town, the trading, being on the ship. Oh it's great. And then I also like the fact that we had a real life pirate. Kenneth is definitely like very tropey but in a good way with regards to what you would imagine a pirate being especially when we get to like the later part of the book. So all of that, I feel like establishing that swashbuckling type of story was really, really well done. I also love Robin Hobb's prose. I know that everybody praises her prose, but it's for good reason. She writes beautifully. The way that she describes things, but not being overly descriptive or over, overly flowery is just so well done. And that leads into her character work. She develops these characters that are so believable and real. And the way that she can make me either love her characters or hate their her characters is so amazing. I have never hated a character more in my life than I thought the Farseer trilogy, but I think she definitely made some competition for the character I hate in the Farseer trilogy because Kyle and Malta, I, 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 I genuinely hate them. I don't hate people in real life, but holy cow, I hate those fictional characters. They are despicable. Another thing I really liked was the relationship between the live ships and the trader families. So in this book, we do see a relationship between Vivacia and Althea, but then we also see a relationship between Wintrow and Vivacia. And it was just, it was really interesting. It was almost like, you know, they, they had a deep love for one another, but it was founded on nothing but blood relationship and they were able to feel what each other felt, understand what each, each other felt and it was just, it was kind of fascinating because I mean it's it's a ship and the way that Robin Hobb made me care about a ship as if it was a person was just says something about her writing but I just really liked the relationship between the live ships and the humans and then we were introduced to a couple of other live ships and it was just really interesting. This story definitely kept me gripped. It was one of those stories that I would think about when I wasn't reading it. And it was one of those stories that I found myself wanting to pick up once I put it down. I was eager to get back into it. And I will say that this book has extremely high stakes. Oh boy. So, and there's multiple plot lines, like I said. Like there's high stakes with regards to finances, the ship, the livelihood of the Vesture family, people themselves. Like there are just so many things at stake where one decision could actually harm all of them. So this book has extremely high stakes and I absolutely loved it because of that.
Now onto my dislikes. So really there wasn't too much that I disliked and I would say my main complaint would be that this book wasn't overly happy. I can't think of one instance in this book that was like, oh, that's a happy moment. Most of this book was pretty bleak. Most of these characters were not the best characters. They didn't make the best decisions. They were selfish. You know, there's a lot of trigger warnings in here. We have alcohol abuse, drug abuse. We have child abuse. We have sexual abuse. So there's a lot of things in this book that are not happy and are somewhat depressing. But despite that, I still felt myself gripped by the story and the characters and to want to keep reading along to see what happened. So if you're looking for a book that's like gonna <laughs> cheer you up or make you escape from something depressing, I wouldn't recommend this because really it's not a happy story. All in all, I really enjoyed Ship of Magic. I think it was a great first installment to this series. We have some really interesting characters, a really interesting um, magic system with these live ships and the relationship they have to the people. We have a really intricate plot line and a lot that is at stake. So I ended up giving Ship of Magic four out of five stars, and I'm very excited to continue with the Mad Ship in April. If you're interested in reading along with us, check out my Discord link down below, and we'd love for you to read along with us. Let me know in the comments if any of you have read Ship of Magic and what you thought of it, and I will see y'all soon in another video. Bye! Mm -hmm.